invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come into your house to worship you today in spirit and in truth. We pray that you would speak to us as we open your word, as we reflect on its pages. We thank you for this opportunity, for we ask them in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me? Oh, amen. Amen. Anyway, we did pray, so we did pray. Our, our topic today is about self-awareness, and it's not about social self-awareness or physical self-awareness or emotional self-awareness, but about spiritual self-awareness. How is a Christian to view themselves, and what is a healthy sense of self-awareness? And many times, we can get into one of two ruts when it comes to our Christian experience, or even maybe more ruts than that. But today, I'd like to highlight three states of self-awareness, spiritual self-awareness that the Bible brings out. The first two are areas that we can fall into very easily, and the last one, of course, is where God desires us to be by His grace. And so very quickly, in our study today, I want to go to the three states of spiritual self-awareness. And the first one is, I'm not a sinner like everyone else. I'm a saint. I'm not a sinner like everyone else. I'm a saint. And this is quite humorous because most of us are like, oh, I, how can anyone be like that? But here it is. This is described in Scripture in Luke chapter 18, verse 11. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer, I thank you, God, that I'm not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery, and I'm certainly not like that tax collector. So here's an individual that is like, I've arrived. I'm ready for translation. A very high sense of his own spirituality. And if we're honest with ourselves in our own self-reflection, it's easy to feel good as long as we're comparing ourselves among ourselves. Just like when we talked about my teeth look white when it's up against something that's not white. But it's easy to compare ourselves among ourselves. I remember in school, there were times when our grades would be posted on the wall with our ID number, top down. And I remember, you know, I was was a fairly good student, studious and so forth. I remember going to to that wall. And there were times, believe it or not, my name was at the top. And I would walk away from that wall, and and my friend, and I'd be like, what'd you get on that test? And they'd be like, 70%. I'd be like, oh, I wouldn't say it. But in my heart, in my mind, I said, oh, what a neophyte. (laughs) I'm just being real. I'm just being honest. Oh, if they were only like me. I'm just being honest. And we have certain situations and dynamics where we may be good in something and we look around and we say, oh, I wish that all men be as I am, relative righteousness. Relative righteousness. And as long as we're looking around ourselves, comparing ourselves among ourselves, it's easy to be righteous. And so here, this Pharisee is standing there and he says, God, I'm glad you have me. I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. And I'm like, you look next to him, and he said, and I'm certainly not like him. Spiritual pride. This is an area that we can fall into very easily when when we make the focus on others and this relativism that comes into play, and this plays out in different aspects. You know, it's easy to feel good in basketball if I'm playing with a bunch of people that are five foot one, right? I feel good. I'm five foot six. Hey, and so here it is. Acts of the Apostles, page 561 and 562. Here is something about self-awareness. Let the recording angels write the history of the holy struggles and conflicts of the people of God. Let them record their prayers, but let not... I can't read today, but let not God be dishonored by the declaration from human lips, I am 
sinless. I am holy. Sanctified lips will never give utterance to such presumptuous words. In other words, we should never come to the place in our Christian experience, to the place where we say, you know what? I'm holy. Wow. I haven't sinned in five years. You should be like me. Here it is, Acts of the Apostles 5.61, none of the apostles and prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Think about the implications of that. They wrote the Bible. Never claimed to be without sin. Men who have lived the nearest to God, men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act, men whom God has honored with divine light and power have confessed the sinfulness of their nature. They have put no confidence in the flesh. They have claimed no righteousness of their own, but have trusted wholly in the righteousness of Christ. So here's this strange dichotomy about Christian self-awareness is that, look, we can never come to the place like that Pharisee where we say, look, I've arrived. I'm glad I'm not like that person. I'm holy. I'm sanctified. I've never sinned. That self-awareness, it's actually an absence of self-awareness. This person has a zero self-awareness. And we, we have those experiences where we, uh, I used to wonder this in, in high school. I thought, what if I'm insane and everyone else around me knows it but me? Has it ever crossed your mind? I don't know, maybe it's just me. But, but, but this, is, this is a strange state to be in. In other words, like everyone else sees it but you. And you think that you're incredible and awesome, but in actuality, that couldn't be further from the truth. And so here it is in Signs of the Times, May 16, 1895, when the conflict of life is ended, when the armor is laid off at the feet of Jesus, when the saints of God are glorified, then and only then will it be safe to claim that we are saved and sinless. Until Jesus comes and we're given a glorified body, we can't say it. The thought shouldn't even cross our minds into this relative righteousness. Now, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17. This is the message to the Laodicean church, and here is a description of a group of people, which is us, by the way, of zero self-awareness. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17 describing the Laodicean church. And by the way, some people think that Laodicea means lukewarm. That's a characteristic of Laodicea. Laodicea actually means a people judged. Daniel means God is my judge, is a description of God's people, the ideal of what they're to live and be in the end of time. And so here it is. In verse 16 and 17 and onward, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. And look in verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And here's the rub. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Here is an individual that thinks that they are dressed to the nines. And we call this insanity nowadays. That is dressed with Versace. I don't know, I'm not into fashion. You know, all of the latest and the greatest from Paris. This person is, thinks that they are dressed. They have this mental image of who they are and what they're dressed in, but they don't know that they're actually naked. We call that insanity nowadays. I mean, if a person was walking around town naked, and said, please put, and you said, please put some clothes on. They said, what are you talking about? I've got the finest clothes in the land. You'd be like, look, we need to get you institutionalized. There's something wrong with you. And this is a description of spiritual insanity. An individual, a characteristic in the end of time of someone that thinks that they are spiritual, that they've arrived, but in reality, it couldn't be farther from the truth. And notice what the message to Laodicea is. Buy from me eye salve that you may see. This is, I believe, of the three conditions, the worst one to be in because you don't know your condition. It's a level of self-deception. 
We think that we've arrived, but in reality, we are wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. So, three states of spiritual self-awareness. The first one, zero self-awareness. I'm not a sinner like everyone else. I'm a saint. The tendency to compare ourselves amongst ourselves. And the focus of the first category, the state of spiritual awareness, is relativism. It is to focus on someone else to make themselves feel better. You focus on someone that is struggling more than you to say that you're a saint. And so it's a relative righteousness. The focus is on someone else. And the second one is, I'm such a bad person, there is no hope for me. This is on the other side of the spectrum. The first characteristic or the first category is an individual that makes others the ground for their righteousness. And the second one is an individual that makes self the focus. And quite frankly, uh, I think this is one that is a pitfall for for many of us, especially those that are more analytical and perhaps have a little bit more of a a melancholy personality. And, And look, have you ever had real introspection of yourself? It's quite depressing, honestly. And and think about why you really do something. You, you can go crazy thinking about it. Your real motivations. And, and many times we have a coping mechanism that takes place because if we really dive down deep and do true in, introspection as to what our real motives are, um, many people can't handle that. And so you live a little bit in an alternate reality because you can't see yourself. But for those that and I have the courage to really dive down. And if I were to ask myself, David, what is the real reason I get up to preach on Sabbath morning? Ooh, that's pretty complex. Now, my standard answer is for the glory of God, preaching the gospel. But if I go down really, really deep, it's kind of like, I like to hear, just being real. Pastor, that was a great sermon. Oh, praise God. You know what I'm talking about? But, but when you dive down deep, it, it's, it's a mixture. It, it, it's complicated. It, it's complex. Even our motivations to do good are, have this selfish tinge to them. And so if we go inward, and if we're honest with ourselves, and we really look in the mirror as to who we really are, it's depressing. It's scary, and so I want to invite you to go to Romans chapter 7. Now, there's a huge debate as to whether Romans 7 is is converted or unconverted. I really don't want to get into that this morning, but here it is. This is a condition of humanity that we all struggle with. In Romans chapter 7, it describes the internal battle, and notice the way that Romans chapter 7 ends in verse 21 through 24. I find then a law that is evil that is present within me. The one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law according to God in the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin, which is in my members. So here Paul is having an honest look at himself. He's saying, look, I have almost this split personality. I have a part of me that wants to do good, wants to do right, but I have another part of me that's going the other way, and it's a struggle. I have motivations that are pulling me a different way. And notice the way that he begins to conclude this chapter. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin that is in my members. And look in verse 24. O wretched man that I am. There's only two places where that word wretched is used in the New Testament. It's here and in Revelation chapter 3 talking about the Laodicean church. And here it is in verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And this second category of self-awareness gets stuck in Romans 7, verse 24. That's where we get stuck. Wretched man that I am. There's no hope. And I've had conversations even thoughts that cross my mind. I'm hopeless. You ever have that thought cross your mind? I'm never going to be saved. You you have those thoughts cross your mind? I mean, I am am so... 
there, there's no hope. And we get stuck in Romans 7, verse 24. Oh, wretched man that I am. Have you ever felt that way before? Just honestly looking at yourself and saying, look, I, I'm a wretch. I'm a wretch. And, and I praise God. This is why we need to read the rest of the Bible, okay? Because look, Romans 7, 24, you camp out there, it's a terrible place to be. And category number two is, is a pitfall that we can all fall into. You know, you either fall into category number one where you're not honest with yourself and you're looking around as a coping mechanism to feel better about yourself, comparing yourself amongst yourself, to feel better about your lack of righteousness. It's a relative righteousness. But the second category is you focus inward and you get stuck in verse 24. But praise God for 25. Look at 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's where God wants to move us, out of verse 24 into verse 25. And so we come to the last category, or oh, before we do that, Steps of Christ, page 70. So you are not to look to yourself, not to let the mind dwell upon self, but to look to Christ. Let the mind dwell upon His love, upon the beauty, the perfection of His character. So we come to the final one, and here, here it is. This, is. this is where that healthy sense of unworthiness lies. Here it is. In verse 3, or in or the number 3 here, I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus and have a healthy sense of my unworthiness. Now, you're like, Pastor, where did you come up with that? Uh, go to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and here we have... A, a scene in the, the book of Isaiah where Isaiah sees the throne room of God. And this is, this is sanctuary language. Let's pick it up in verse 1. In the third year, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And he cried to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Verse 4. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. And so here it is. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah has the privilege of being ushered in by vision to the very throne room of God. And there's sanctuary imagery all over this. Remember the Ark of the Covenant with the, with the seraphim above it. So, but he's seeing the real thing. And so here Isaiah is. The glory of God is there. God is sitting on his throne. And above the throne room of God are these, are these seraphim, these angels that are hovering above the throne room of God, shielding Shekinah glory. And they're crying, holy Holy, holy, there's implications of the Trinity there according to theologians, but, but here Isaiah is, and he's seeing the majesty of the God of heaven. That's his paradigm of focus right then. The next verse is the universal reaction of everyone that has seen God. And so here's that tension. So, so Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 4, he's seeing God, the beauty of who God is. And look in verse 5. In that perspective, in that encounter, seeing the glory of God, verse 5, and so I said, woe is what? Woe is me. Notice, notice the unique tension of what's taking place in Isaiah chapter 6. The focus is on God, His glory, Jesus, the beauty of who God is. But in that tension, in that focus of that encounter with deity and divinity, there is this sense of unworthiness. Amen? And so, it's not category number one, but it's not category number two either. Here is that unique tension where, where Isaiah is ushered into the very throne room of God and he's having this experience with divinity. He's in awe, enraptured by the glory of God, and that's where his focus is. But the byproduct of that, 
the, the result of his own self-awareness in that engagement with divinity is like, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. Woe is me, for I'm undone. For I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And here you're going to see Isaiah is about to experience the gospel. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which was taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. So, so he's experiencing the gospel. He sees God. He senses his own unworthiness. And he is forgiven and it goes on in verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And he says, I'll go. Here am I. Send me. Every person that's experienced the gospel becomes a missionary for the gospel. You're either a missionary or you're a mission field. I'm keeping my eyes on Jesus and have a healthy sense of my unworthiness. This is what I believe is biblical self-awareness. This beautiful tension of where the focus of the Christian is on Jesus, but the byproduct of that focus is a healthy sense of my unworthiness. But praise the Lord, He doesn't leave us there to wallow in our wretchedness. He brings us to the cross. He brings us to the Savior. Now, I want to read this from Ellen White. Bible echo, the closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes, for your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in distinct contrast with His perfect character. Be not discouraged. This is an evidence that Satan's delusions are losing their power. And so here is, is the paradox of the way our self-awareness works. The more we progress in our Christian experience, the closer we come to Jesus, the more we appreciate His beauty, we're, we're, we're actually become more like Him and more quote-unquote holy, but our own self-awareness is quite different than what God sees in us. Our own self-awareness is, Lord, I'm unworthy. I'm imperfect. I need Jesus. And so the irony of this is that an individual that says, look, I've arrived and I'm sinless and I'm better than everyone else is farther away from Jesus than an individual that is walking in accordance with him that has a healthy sense of his own unworthiness. The closer you come to Jesus, the more you'll have a sense of your own imperfections. And this is the thing. When we talk about perfection, Christian perfection, there's never a place in Scripture where a person stands up and says, I'm perfect. But you can see plenty of instances where God looks down from heaven and says, that man's perfect. There's a difference. God sees with new eyes and says, look, I see perfection there because of the righteousness of Christ and His merits have been applied to my account. But there is no self-awareness of that perfection. Think of Peter. Uh, remember the story? He's out there by the lake, and Jesus says, throw your net on the other side, and the net fills with fish. I mean, this, is, this speaks to a fisherman. All right, middle of the day, the water is crystal clear and blue, so he throws it on that side, and, and he's thinking in his mind, uh, Jesus is a carpenter, I'm a fisherman, but oh well, let's just do it. So he throws it over there, and, and immediately that, that net just fills up with fish, and it's about to break. And in that moment, something happens in the mind of Peter where he recognizes that he is in the presence of God. And I want you to notice what he says. In 5 verse 8 of Luke, when, P when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus. And notice what he says. Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. 
He has that reaction. He, he's in the presence of God, and he says, look, I'm too much of a sinner. Now, the book Desire of Ages paints an interesting picture on page 248, 246. Humanity, with its weakness and sin, was brought in contrast with the perfection of divinity. Same thing that happened in Isaiah. Peter realizes who he is in the presence of God. He felt altogether deficient and unholy. Thus, it has been with all who have been granted a view of God's greatness and majesty. Peter exclaimed, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. And I love this part, this last sentence. Yet he clung to the feet of Jesus, feeling that he could not be parted from him. What a beautiful picture that is. And so there's the tension. I'll be honest. There's moments in my Christian experience I say, Lord, ah, I need help, and I'm I'm pretty hopeless. Messed up. And, And I take comfort in this reality that as long as I keep my focus on Jesus, He's gonna He's gonna take care of the rest of the journey. Amen? And that's where we need to have faith and hope. Look. We are never going to feel this side of heaven like we've arrived. We're never going to feel this side of heaven sinless and perfect. Notice I said feel. You're never going to wake up one day and say, Woo, translate me now. I'm ready. You're never going to feel that. But by faith, You can believe in the merits and the righteousness of Christ regardless of the way that you feel. And that's why it's righteousness by faith. Because the way that you feel is totally in the opposite direction. So you get up in the morning and you say, Lord, I feel unworthy. But by faith, I claim your righteousness. And I walk by faith regardless of the way that I feel. And so we're always in this unique tension of getting closer to Jesus, but never feeling that we've arrived, never feeling that we've gotten there, never feeling that we've crossed the finish line. And and that's the unique place of the Christian self-awareness journey that God always calls us to be in this journey. And so I want want to encourage you this morning to, to walk with Him. Amen? regardless of the way that you may or may not feel that day. Look, there's some days I wake up and I don't feel spiritual. There may be a variety of reasons for it. Lack of sleep. Toddler, two-year-old. Anyway, you, you, you know what I mean? All, all of these come into into play. I'm not blaming my son, this caveat, if he listens to this later, but anyways, okay. And, and, and so, I'm just saying there's a variety of physical factors that, that go into this, but look, regardless of the way that you feel or don't feel that way doesn't mean that God's posture to you has changed that day. Faith and feeling are as far as the east is from the west, and that's why it is righteousness by faith, by faith. Now, let's make it practical. We hear this all the time. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. What does that mean? And, and the book, Desire of Ages, you know, I got, someone asked me to get a copy of this. Um, and Ariel, if you're here, I have a copy just for you that I brought. Um, Janet, I can give it to you. Well, we need to order more copies of this because this book changed my life. And I want to encourage you to, to, to read the book, Desire of Ages. Read the Gospels. If you want to find out what Jesus is like, really, Don't go to society, don't watch the movies to figure it out. Go to the Bible. Go to the spirit of prophecy. And this is a very easy, wonderful read. Desire of Ages, page 83. And this is how we turn our eyes upon Jesus, practically speaking. It would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. Now you're thinking, look, I mean, that's a pretty high bar, a thoughtful hour. Well, start with 10 minutes. But start. Get up that day. And, and I encourage you in your devotional life, you know, don't, don't spend your devotional time studying like Daniel 11. 
okay, and the king of the north. Now, there's a separate time for that, or the daily, all right? In your morning devotional time, that should be the time that you're looking at Jesus, okay? Because we need that focus, that centering moment every single day. Because look, if we don't have the Isaiah chapter 6 experience every single day, we're going to fall into one of those pitfalls. We're going to approach that day and say, look, Lord, I've arrived. I'm certainly glad I'm not like that person. Or we're going to walk out and say, Lord, I'm a wretch and I'm depressed. We're going to walk out like that. But if we have the Isaiah 6 experience where we see God every single day, yes, we have a healthy sense of our unworthiness, but there's hope. So start with 10 minutes. We should take it point by point. Let the imagination grasp each scene, especially the closing ones. This is not talking about analysis. This is talking about right brain thinking. Praise God. You know, I feel like the scientists, with all due respect, and the engineers have taken over theology. It's time for the artists to engage too, biblically speaking. And here is biblical right brain reflection on scripture to imagine the scene in our minds because what it does right brain engagement takes it from a theory to a person to a person imagine gethsemane imagine the drops of sweat that are blood imagine jesus turning to the to the to the soldiers and saying father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And as we imagine using our right brain that God has given us, the right part of our brain, the creative, imaginative part, it says, as we dwell upon His great sacrifice for us, our confidence in Him will be more constant. How many of you want that? You want to be confident in what Jesus is doing. Our love will be quickened, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. How many of you want that today? To say, Lord, help me to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we can have an experience like Isaiah did every single day by reflecting on you and your goodness and your character we can be changed into the same image from glory to glory, from faith to faith, and from day to day. Lord, help us not to fall into the rut of thinking that we're better than everybody else. Help us not to fall into the rut of thinking that there's no hope for us, but help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, having a healthy sense of our unworthiness, but never losing hope. Bless and keep us to that end, for we ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.